the European Parliament here in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight, and this is what we have for you on the program. Thorny debate. France moves to outlaw anti-Zionism after a spate of anti-Semitic attacks. Food fight. Germany vows to crack down on 11 million tons of food being trashed each year. Troubled times. Austria's chancellor sits down with Donald Trump in a meeting that only highlights the Europe-US divide. Rebels or deserters? Will the UK political establishment be the biggest Brexit casualties? And Brexit boo-boo, why Jean-Claude Juncker had a plaster on his face before meeting Theresa May. All right, it is time to meet our panelists this evening. Joining us is Seb Dance. He is a British MEP with the Socialists and Democrats. Seb, what are you watching closely tonight? Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> there are so many shifting things to be watching at the moment. I suppose I'm watching developments back home and looking at the, uh, uh, the divide in the British political system, which uh, I think is an in inevitable consequence of Brexit. So right. uh, I know we'll be discussing that in a bit. Oh, yes, indeed we will. And also joining us is Darmendra Kanani. He's director of Insight at a think tank, a think tank Friends of Europe, Darmendra. Which uh, of these stories are you watching closely? I think they're all interlinked, but I think the food fight is one, I think, that um, does often gets neglected and one that deserves a bit more attention. It is a big uh, European issue, definitely. Absolutely. All right, and also joining us is Rabbi Menashe Margolin. He is the chairman of the European Jewish Association. Rabbi, what story are you watching closely? I think we can guess. Well, of course, the uh, latest wake-up call coming from France in regards to anti-Semitism. All right, and that is exactly where we are beginning tonight, because anti-Semitism is at its worst levels in France since World War II. That is according to the French president, Emmanuel Macron, who has announced a wide-reaching crackdown on anti-Jewish hate. But just hours after that announcement, well, this is what Paris woke up to. Fresh anti-Jewish graffiti, plastered doors, public toilets and uh, benches. It comes just days after Jewish, gr Jewish graves were desecrated at a cemetery in eastern France. And a week after, a new report said anti-Jewish attacks had jumped 74% last year. And in response, Macron is introducing new measures, including banning three far-right groups and defining anti-Zionism as a form of anti-Semitism, which would practically outlaw it. Here is what the French president had to say. L'antisionisme est une des formes modernes de l'antisémitisme. C'est pourquoi je confirme que la France, qui, comme vous l'avez rappelé, l'a endossé en décembre avec ses partenaires européens, mettra en œuvre la définition de l'antisémitisme adoptée par l'Alliance internationale pour la mémoire de la Shoah. All right, uh, Macron will refer to anti-Zionism there and what he was talking about. According to the Oxford Dictionary, Zionism is a movement for originally the re-establishment and now the development and protection of a Jewish nation in what is now Israel. Okay, so let's, um, you know, what, what's interesting here is before the show, we were trying to get an actual definition of Zionism and anti-Zionism. We called also the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, and they didn't have a definition for it. So Emmanuel Macron is moving to essentially outlaw anti-Zionism, but how can you outlaw, outlaw something we don't, we can't even define? Darmendra, I'll start with you. I, I think... This is such a shame. It's about a politician um, taking a knee-jerk reaction to something that's really serious. And it's, I'm, not, I'm not denying the importance of this, because I feel sorry for those people who've lived through the consequences of World War, World War II. And grandparents and parents will see what they're watching now and feel horrified by this. But actually, for a, pre for a president to actually then say, actually, I'm just going to outlaw uh, Zionism, is the wrong thing to do. He's currently engaged in a national debate about the future and the prosperity and the security of France. Engage his citizens in this conversation rather than simply crafting out something which is going to be very difficult to define, very difficult to respond to. And he's seen the reaction immediately. When you do something like this, like pull a lever like he has done overnight, say, I'm I'm going to outlaw it. It actually creates further distance from those who are perpetrating those acts. There's something deeper at the heart of why these people are doing so this. So you think it's a knee-jerk reaction. What about you, Rabbi? Because um, we, we, I think Benjamin Netanyahu was, was quite pleased with what Manuel Macron was doing. What, what is your reaction to what Macron's doing? Well, first of all, what Macron says is too little, too late. Um, European leaders failed to ensure the security of Jewish people in Europe. 
that too many uh, of the Jewish people in Europe considering leaving this, country, this continent is because European leaders were too late to understand and identify how deep is the issue of anti-Semitism. Now, cancer and disease doesn't disappear just with words. Until now, and even including this last statement, for me, it's almost nothing what Macron just said. Because with words, you cannot fight anti-Semitism. But do you agree with the, um, the notion of an anti-Zionism approach? Because we've got, we've got anti-racism legislation across Europe. And it's, it's, been, it's there for ages. It's just not being applied effectively. In France, for him, what he's doing is going to have a backlash. Isn't it better that he actually engages in this conversation? I think, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. We cannot uh, ignore the fact that a big percentage of personal attacks against Jews all over Europe come from people who are officially calling just anti-Israel or just because he's using Israel as an as excuses well, What do you feel about Jews. Zionism? Mm. What do you feel about Zionism? I think that going to definitions, is, it, it's so stupid when you speak about such a huge issue here. There's no question that the Jewish state is the only uh, country around the world that ensure the safety of the Jewish people from all over the world. This is the guarantee. But, the guarantee, the right. life insurance for Jews around the world. Attacking Israel Mm. meaning attacking Jews. There's no question about that. I, I think the importance of, of, of defining this is because how do you outlaw something you cannot define in legal terms? What do you think, Sam? Yeah, well, I mean, there's an age-old issue about freedom of speech and, and all the rest mm. of it, but I think, you know, there is a clear distinction uh, between criticising the Israeli government, which mm -hmm. is something that I would have no mm -hmm. difficulty mm -hmm. in doing, mm -hmm. um, but then criticising or indeed attacking the right for the state of Israel to exist, which in my mind is something completely different, mm -hmm. as the rabbi says. Yeah. You know, is often a proxy for, for, for anti-Semitism. For those who were defending freedom of speech, is this a slippery, slippery slope we're going down? Well, I mean, we don't have absolute protection of freedom of speech uh, anyway. I mean, you, there, there are certain things that, are, that you cannot say mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they cause such offence, they cause such division that it, mm. it, is, it is simply illegal to, uh, to, to say or to print or whatever. And, and uh, for me, uh, criticising or indeed saying that the state of Israel has no right to exist, in my mind, constitutes... Uh, a form of anti-Semitism. Uh, anti yes, if, if I may interrupt, there are two things that are very important to remember about that. Uh, take the BDS movement, mm -hmm. which is the movement they call to uh, boycott Israel. Yeah. This movement gets support, financially support, from the European Union and for so many European governments, from taxpayer money. For what? For boycotting Israel, which officially, on the other hand, of course, Europe is against boycotting Israel. So you see this paradox. So mm. for me, that's what I'm saying. This great statement of Macron will remain on paper as long as the European leaders does not take real action to understand that attacking Israel in, with a double standard, okay. it's... Cause I have attacks. another question for you, but I'll let Darmen react I, first. I think, yeah. it's, I think it's really important not to confuse the, uh, the criticism of a head of state and his domestic and international policy with anti-Semitism. I think to do that mm. is a dangerous path mm. to follow, and it actually aggravates the situation even further. And I think we must separate the two, and that's where the freedom of expression, but also the danger of thinking about anti-Zionism, because it complicates and confuses the issue. Mm. We, should, we should absolutely be clear where a state behaves in a way which is not in accordance with human rights and other, other uh, international uh, 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 frameworks. Right. But that shouldn't be confused with the, the, the hatred okay, for Jewish Sure, no, but that's a legitimate criticism. But, but what, what, what it strays often into is actually that state has no right to exist. Mm. And there's a very, very clear difference in my mind between a, a, attacking the policies of a particular government Absolutely. that is mm. elected... I'm sorry to say, and, yeah. and to be okay. very, very okay. realistic... The BDS movement, for example, which is the biggest anti-Israel movement in Europe, is responsible for thousands of personal attacks against Jews okay. in Europe. It's very clear. Rabbi, I want the to the ask link you, is very clear. I want Please. to ask you uh, what Darmendra was pointing out. So when does legitimate criticism of Israel as a state, of the leader of its mm. policies, where, where do you draw the line between mm. that, that's legitimate, and anti-Semitism for you? First of all, we have to, uh, to make it very clear that 8 million Israelis who criticize Israeli policies yeah, from absolutely. time to time. Mm -hmm. There are millions of French who criticize sure. the French uh, government policy from time to time. Normally, in every country, you have its own system that criticizes policies. Mm -hmm. As long as the uh, Europeans attacking Israel is with not double standard, triple standard, mm -hmm. attacking Israel nonsense with unlimited uh, uh, times, not comparable to any other attacks against any other countries, that's mm -hmm. something that 
show you very, very clearly that it's not just a legitimate criticism anymore, but it's a very, in particular, attempts to again I mean, attack the Jewish I think state. this is a really sensitive topic mm. that's with on you know, long-running debate and I think this has sparked new debate in France actually and it will continue. Right. On, only one issue if I may say. Yeah. This debate have victims sure. every year. Mm. Sure. Thousands of people are attacked every year because of this debate. Therefore it's very important. You're pointing it out. All right. Thank you. Well, now we'll move on because um, another topic uh, that we are watching is Brexit because 36 days to go, that's all the time left. The two main political we'll parties in the UK <laughs> indeed are splitting and talks with Brussels appear to be at a standstill. And it's just another day in British politics. Do take a look. It's disappointing that some MPs have left our party to sit with disaffected Tory MPs. Better late than never. Two days after a handful of MPs quit his party, Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn responds. These MPs now want to abandon the policies on which they were elected. So the decent and democratic thing for them to do is to resign and put themselves up for election. Meanwhile in Brussels, Theresa May rolls into town for the latest round of Brexit talks and is met by protesters dressed as unicorns. A not-so-subtle message here, perhaps? disappointment here too. Well, I'm saddened by the decision that uh, three former members of my party have taken today. They have given dedicated service to our party over a long time. Well, yes. I, I, no, I was a <laughs> Once they'd worked out who's the Prime Minister, Mrs May and Jean-Claude Juncker wrapped up their talks, releasing a joint statement which suggests some movement on Theresa May's part. The Prime Minister acknowledged the EU's position, the statement says, as well as the letters sent by President Donald Tusk and President Juncker on the 14th of January. Regular Brexit previewers will, of course, be in no doubt that the January letter insisted that the withdrawal agreement is not open for renegotiation. A breakthrough, perhaps, for which it seems some thought Mr. Juncker might have paid a high price. OK, let us uh, go now to London with our correspondent, Vincent McAvini. Vincent, so Jeremy Corbyn, he's been in Brussels today. In fact, you yeah. just met him uh, earlier. Has he shed any light on the Brexit negotiations? Good evening, Tessa. Well, we haven't heard anything yet from Jeremy Corbyn and his team, but everyone is more interested in what's going on here at Westminster. There are a number of MPs on watch for joining the new independent group. The names Justine Greening and Dominic Grieve are definitely ones on the Conservative side being banded about. And I'm joined now by one of the seven Labour MPs who joined the independent group on Monday, resigning his Labour membership, Mike Gapes. Um, Mike, do you think you're about to get some new members into your group? You've got three yesterday. Any more on the way? We know that there are large numbers of members of Parliament um, across Parliament in different parties who are extremely unhappy with their party leaderships and are looking for a new way forward. They know that, that politics is broken and it's uh, time for a fresh start. But each of those decisions is very much a personal decision. And... There are many MPs, like I was, agonising for a very long time before they finally make the decision to leave a, a party that they've been in, in my case, for 50 years. And are you in any active talks with some MPs about how you could bring them across, how you'd facilitate it? There are loads of conversations going on. Um, and uh, there were last week, before we uh, made our, our move on Monday, and there are still conversations going on at this moment. Um, but, of course, we've got very important votes on Brexit this week, uh, Wednesday and potentially Thursday and maybe even into Friday. Um, and some people have said that they're not going to do anything until after those votes, which are crucial about the future of our country. Because, of course, you're now a bigger party, well, you're not a party, a group, than the DUP. They've only got 10 MPs, you've got 11. Theresa May has such a thin margin. Are you talking to enough Conservatives that you could take away her majority? I don't think we, we're seeing it in those terms. Uh, there are lots of members of Parliament, as I said, who are very unhappy. But uh, I think there will be a process going on here, and it will potentially take a few weeks or a few months. But there will be more people joining the independent group. I've no doubt about that. 
And what's next for you? How will the next couple of weeks work? Are you going to set yourselves up as a party? Will there be a leader? What will you do with the Lib Dems? Right. Okay, let, let's unpick that. Firstly, uh, next week we have a meeting where we have to formalise ourselves. We have got to adopt some, some rules, um, uh, uh, declarations, um, and we need to uh, then decide, well, w will some of us take on a lead role on particular areas uh, in, in the chamber? And we, we've got that meeting um, in the early next week. But we are not um, going to be a party. We are still an independent group. We're not a party yet, and that is a complicated, long process. You have to register with the Electoral Commission uh, and various other issues. Um, and at this stage, uh, we don't have any infrastructure. You know, we, we launched on Monday. Um, we set up a website, and there was so much interest in it, it crashed. And uh, the public of really that people are crying out for what we're doing and it's quite clear we've got to now build the infrastructure uh, to try and deal with this it's fantastic and just very quickly are you surprised by the response and you were a 50-year labor man what was it like to leave um i obviously i i had mixed emotions but i personally come to terms with the fact uh, nearly a year ago that I could not stand at an election and call for the people to vote for um, potentially Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister. That uh, was what finally drove me. But I've had very warm discussions. Labour Party members, lifelong friends of mine are still my friends and they're being very warm to me. Mike Gapes, thank you very much. Well, Tessa, that's the view here in Westminster. Everyone still on watch to see what this new independent group does. Back to you in Brussels. All right, thanks for that, uh, Vincent McAvinney there. And joining me now in the studio to discuss this, we have Dan Dalton. He's a British MEP with the ECR group here at the Parliament. And also joining us, our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. And still with us, we have Seb Dance. He is a Labour MEP with the SD group. Seb, obviously, I'm going to go to you there. <laughs> um, you said key word yet uh, when the, Mr. Gapes was was talking about mm. uh, the future. But also, you were just in a meeting with Jeremy Corbyn. Mm. I can imagine there wasn't a lot of warm feelings there towards people who left. What's the view there? Rebels or deserters? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, it does depend on who you talk to. We didn't talk about that issue, incidentally, sure. with Jeremy. We were talking about Brexit, funnily enough. Um, but yes, I mean, Mike is a, is a, is a good friend of mine, actually, and, and uh, has been a fantastic colleague uh, he's a staunch European. He's also an international socialist. He's someone who is, is steeped in the history of the labor movement uh, and the labor movement's uh, priorities at a European level. He is, he is, he is absolutely steeped in that history. So it's very sad to see that he's felt the need to leave the Labour Party. Um, but, you know, I've always been of the view that Brexit... Uh, is so profoundly shocking uh, to the British political system that it was bound to produce effects like this. Sure. And, and Dan, I mean, this is not just a Labour Party issue. You've got Tory members also who've jumped ship. What, what's your view on that? Well, I mean, I'm disappointed, like most Conservatives. Um, but, you know, I, th I think they made the wrong decision. I think you've always got to stay within the church, within the uh, party, and try and reform it from inside. Because in our case, I think we've always been a very broad church. Ideologically, uh, there, there are big differences between different Conservatives. So, if you're going to change the party, which obviously is what they wanted to do, you need to do it from inside. But they just couldn't, but, fundamentally. They well, just couldn't wouldn't you, well, wouldn't you well, describe the ERG, which some would describe mm. as a party within a party? Well, yeah. mm. I mean, they've got a leadership structure, essentially. Uh, they are organised. They've got a different agenda. They've tried to replace the Prime Minister. No, I, 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 in, in those circumstances, when they seem to be in the ascendancy, mm. I, I, and, and you're, you're at odds, which is what Anna Subri said yesterday, which is that she hasn't left the Conservative Party, the Conservative Party has left her. But the Conservative Party, as I say, is a broad church. It has been throughout history. It's moved different factions of wings have been in control at different times of, the, uh, of history. Not so long ago, the ERG felt that they were very much marginalised by the leadership of David Cameron. So, you know, this is what happens but in it's parties. Not, but okay. it's not great when you've also got, like, Dominic Grieve yesterday, Justin Greening today, you know, former cabinet ministers but, saying that they cannot stay in this party okay, if it go ahead, goes Seth. down the Brexit. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, broad church is one thing. Uh, but, you know, obviously the Labour Party is also a broad church. We are two very in a two-party system, you have to be. Mm. But when one element of that broad church actually then crushes dissent uh, of the various leaderships, which is what you're seeing, mm. incidentally, in both political mm. parties, uh, then, it, then, it, then that kind of broad church 
does fracture, it has to fracture because mm. beca there, there is no room in effect for... So where, where, does, the, where does that okay. leave you then? Well, I mean, I, I, I think very clearly that uh, the British political system is coming under the kind of strain that, that means that, 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 it, that this kind this of This is what I'm saying. Is, is, is if I'm watching it from Europe where, you know, there are some multi-party systems mm. here, is it such a bad thing to have uh, another party? Well, the thing is, we have a different system in the UK. You have a first-past-the-post okay. system, so you know, the whole system is based around big parties and two big parties. Groups that fracture and new groups, new parties, they often struggle to make an impact. And I agree in part of what Seb was saying about Brexit being the cause of this. And on the Conservative side, it's clearly Brexit that's led to the split. Sure. But on the Labour side, Brexit is not the only issue. The sure. anti-Semitism issue is also an mm -hmm. issue. The leadership mm -hmm. of Jeremy Corbyn mm -hmm. is an issue. So I think it's not simply just Brexit. I mean, there are other forces at play in British society at the moment that are moving the so, foundation. Yeah, sure. of so, 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 for okay. example, could yeah. you, would you agree with Mike Gapes that he couldn't honestly hand his, hold his hand in his heart and say he would campaign for Jeremy Corbyn to become Prime Minister? And that would I mean, be I, that's his decision, obviously. But and would you uh, agree with Mike Gapes? Would I agree? Well, I don't share his view. Okay. No, I, I'm in the Labour Party, I believe in the Labour Party as, as the vehicle not only to stop Brexit, but also mm -hmm. actually as the as the only vehicle for for delivering change. Well, Jeremy Corbyn's not going to stop but, Brexit. Uh, well, not on his own necessarily, but the meeting we've just had with him, obviously, we, we you know, there are a range of views within the party, but actually we are moving very clearly towards to a situation Brexit. where a public vote may well be part of Labour's policy. That is clearly the direction that we're travelling, and I'm willing uh, to do anything and everything it takes to continue that journey within the Labour Party to get the Labour Party into a much mm. better position on Brexit. But it's very clear. Mm that the pro-European members of the Conservative Party are having a much harder time, in my view, of persuading the Prime Minister of any of the merits of, her, of, of their case. And I think that is why you've seen the splits in the Tory party. And, and you know, people do, are coming to do, their own Do you, do you okay. think that these MPs leaving, though, makes the argument within Labour more difficult for a second referendum? No, I don't, actually, because unfortunately for some people, being pro-European is seen as being anti-Jeremy. And now that they have left the party, there is clearly a huge majority of the Labour Party membership who want a people's vote, who want a public vote. And the fact that we are in this party and that we are prepared to fight for this party shows you that this is not about the leadership. This is about a fundamental issue affecting All right, the country. Very, just very quickly before we go, Dan, any more jitters in the Tory party? I don't think so. I mean, obviously, we've got... We are vote. waiting I mean, for more. No, 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 we've got the I mean, vote next no, no, week. We're the, trying to the, get an agreement before the I mean, vote. There are. We are waiting for it. We're watching that. <laughs> the key thing is, of course, next week. And whether, whether we can get any changes from Brussels that allows the withdrawal deal to get through Parliament next not week. That's the key issue. And uh, who knows what's going to happen next week? He says it's not going to happen. Okay. All right, we have a lot more coming up for you on Raw Politics. Close for maintenance. Why a group of islands in Europe is shutting out tourists for a weekend. Plus, 11 million tons a year. Germany gets tough on food that ends up in the trash. That's next. Welcome back. Stop trusting the sell-by date on food. That was a message from the German government yesterday as they tried to crack down on the 11 million tons of food that are wasted by households each year. Now, this advert is part of the government's new campaign. They are telling people to trust their senses. If the food looks and smells okay, then it probably is. It's part of a range of measures to cut food waste in half by 2030, although critics say the measures will barely make a dent in Germany's food waste mountain. So let's take a look at some of the measures being suggested. They're telling people to store food properly at home, to trust their senses, as we said, not the best before date. They're asking manufacturers to put food in smaller packages while developing intelligent packaging that will use technology to tell consumers if their food is still edible. All right, joining me in the studio to talk about food waste is Sandra Party from the German Economic Institute. And back with me is Armandra Kanani from Friends of Europe and still with us, Darren McCaffrey, our political editor. Now, just to point out that, that um, tackling food waste is a big deal in Europe. I think so. Europe said that they want to cut food waste by 30% by 2025, 50% by 2030. So we have France uh, who made it um, a law that supermarkets have to work with food waste NGOs. Italy says that stealing small portions of food is not actually not a crime now. I know. So that's interesting. And uh, in the in House of Commons, I think they debated yeah, it, uh, today. today. So it and, is a big deal. It is a big deal. And uh, in lots of different countries, they seem to be trying to come up with initiatives to tackle it. Exactly. Uh, the question is kind of, are they going to be effective? Uh, yeah. Because ultimately, 
you know, you have to use the carrot and stick approach, which is that, yes, it's great, these advertisements and these initiatives are great, but unless there's some kind of legal ramification, like, for example, they've tried in France, it's very difficult to actually change exactly, because consumer or company policy. Because just to point out, the, the measures in Germany, they are all um, voluntary. So what do you think, Sandra? I mean, these measures, sure, they sound great, but can they actually work if they're, you know, voluntary? You can or cannot do it. Yeah, no, um, I must say there has been research that says um, people are aware that they are throwing away perfectly edible food. Um, so in that sense, it might not really be helpful to tell them again that they shouldn't be doing it. Um, but on the other hand, there's also research that shows that um, it's the only way to go, to raise awareness, to make people really um, consider yeah, as it was shown in the adverge, uh, that uh, they should also trust their senses. They so don't your research says it. that the change comes from people. Is that what the research says? That was, what about companies? Yeah, no, the research basically says ultimately it's with the end consumer. So um, there is, of course, um, people are throwing away 50% um, of what could still be used. But, of course, also there is in the, in the, in the strategy, they are aiming at 50% of reduction of food waste. Research also shows you could also go to two thirds because actually only one because, third of what's throwing yeah, away because is. Because if companies, uh, I'll put this in the If yeah. companies, for example, say, okay, here's a pack of 10 and you can only buy a pack of 10, then, then, then you have got no choice to buy Indeed. that and throw it away. And exactly. And I don't think you can reduce this to kind of soundbite politics of, you know, it's either regulation or behavior. It's both. Mm -hmm. And what we know is, you know, whilst we throw away the amount of food that we do in Europe and in the West, quarter of a billion people go hungry to bed every night across the world. And what we need to think more deeply about is how do you get the whole value chain of production? So, you know, we, Europe imports so much from elsewhere that, you know, Africa goes hungry while we throw away food. So how do you kind of change that line? But also, how do we use more, how do we more effectively use biotechnology, for example, and make sure that the waste that we're creating actually goes back into the system for other means. So whilst we try and nudge behaviour, I think, mm -hmm. which is important, because, listen, in the past 50 years, we've become fatter, more abundant, and we live mm -hmm. longer. Mm -hmm. And that's the consequence <laughs> of the 21st century. We are. That is absolutely the case. We're greedier. Yeah. But actually, we need to be thinking much more effectively about how do you nudge behaviour on the street and in a community and in, in, in a family, but... Right. Industry has to actually do so a how, lot more. But, but, I don't know, how I do think, you do I think I, Industry does have to do more, but at the same time, you know, I open a carton of milk... Mm -hmm. I smell it, okay? Right. And if it still smells like milk, I drink it. Like, if there's no blue mould on my bread, even if out a date, I eat, eat it. it. Mm -hmm. You know what? And this, and this is what people have done for centuries. We should rely back on that rather than some dates that some manufacturers put on it. And food yeah. is perishable in different times and different circumstances. Okay. To add to this, though, and this is the big <laughs> elephant in the room, yeah. is the common agricultural policy. Yeah. Okay. Because ultimately, what we are doing as taxpayers, we are subsidising farmers on this continent to produce way too much food that is not needed, Indeed, and then okay. we sell it in supermarkets, yeah, buy one, get one free, when you don't issue. need it. But that's why it's an economic political. The sell-by date is not simply a thing about it going on. Let us, okay. It's a process that's being made to actually generate more food. I'd like to, to go to, to a country, a, a, another country, where it, they've actually successfully cut their food waste in just five years by 25%. I mean, Denmark is leading the way when it comes to reducing food waste. And let's go there. Now let's uh, talk to Mr. Torben Rosenstock, CEO of Denmark's Restaurants and Cafes Association and board member of the Stop Wasting Food movement. Okay, let's talk about Denmark. So how did, how, how did that happen? 20, cutting 25% in five years. What did Denmark do right? Well, it's been a long uh, process. Um, actually, the movement Stop, Waste, uh, Stop Wasting Food started 11 years ago. And I have been promoting this agenda for 11 years. It's been adopted politically. And uh, a lot of different initiatives have started since then. So uh, we recognize that this has to be highly prioritized. That's, you know, that's step one. And I agree with one of your guests that this is not only a question of consumers or political uh, involvement uh, or industry. It's everybody working together on reducing food waste. That's the way to go about it. And actually, things are so progressed here now that we are establishing a policy institute which will give recommendations on how to work further on the food uh, reduction, uh, food waste yeah. reduction uh, initiatives. But the, the question, I, mean, I think we all understand that uh, food waste is a problem, but how hmm. did industry in Denmark, how did consumers in Denmark actually change their mind and said, I will consciously be on board and do something about it? How? 
Well, take for instance retail. Uh, the grocery prices are fairly high in Denmark. And uh, groceries that are close to expiring dates are being reduced in price, which makes this is a very popular for the consumers to buy. That's that's one very specific measure to take, and and reporting back on on how much is throwing out or being thrown out is also a way to 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 measure this from the industry, not just calculate that this is what we expect to lose, but how can we avoid losing it, mm -hmm. and promoting themselves towards the customers, consumers as a company who's actually working very severely with this. Okay. That's, that's creating awareness uh, about this area. And very briefly, what do you think about Germany's uh, measures? It seems ambitious, but it is voluntary. What do you think about that? Well, first and foremost, I must say voluntary is, is, uh, is the way we prefer to go about things. Uh, we don't like uh, the stick that much. So, so in that sense, I agree. Uh, the, the, the number is, is tremendously big. Uh, coming from a very small country like Denmark. But when I look at the average consumer, how much they waste in Germany in, compar in comparison with, with Denmark, 55 kilos in comparison with 47 kilos, there's uh, definitely a potential both in Germany and in Denmark to reduce. Right. That's for sure. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Torben Rosenstock there talking to us from Denmark. I'll go back uh, to you, Sandra, because, you, okay, we have the Denmark model, but the Germany, we were talking about high prices, mm -hmm. but Germany has a different situation there. So what yeah. could work in Germany? Well, what doesn't work in Germany is really the low, the low prices mm -hmm. because what we see in the discounters, etc., people are actually buying Hoarding. stuff at very low mm -hmm. prices and then they throw it away afterwards because you cannot really, you know, continue eating all of this. So um, we actually have seen that higher prices make people consider more what they are buying. So as opposed to, you know, just like, oh, I'm just going to take this kind of um, nice looking steak as well. Um, I think about it. Do I actually going to eat it? Do you need to increase? Well, but isn't the problem for that that that's going to hurt actually the, the poorest, poorest yeah. in Indeed. society the most? Absolutely. I think the issue is not so much about um, the poor or how much they can... Um, sort of um, uh, buy with that because the prices are low. It's not that we're going to skyrocket the prices all of a sudden. It's just a question that reducing uh, the prices, they are pretty low already in Germany and it's not leading to lower amounts it's of food waste. What right, the, these makes me think from what we've just heard from Denmark mm. is that actually we need a systemic approach and that sounds, that sounds mm. kind of woolly and vague but actually <laughs> what I mean by that is that one of the things you could do in Europe and Europe could lead on this is create a kind of a, a, a food waste index mm. per company mm -hmm. and so that actually companies have to report annually on how much food in the distribution and production cycle they are wasting. So they're held to account for this. But also they could do that at a community level. So, you know, municipalities can begin to think about how much food is wasted, mm. how much it is recycled, and therefore you get that kind of um, tripwire or a worm but in the system that changes behaviour. But then you said they don't like the stick very much. They but this is, this is different. This is, this, okay. is, this, is, this is not saying it's regulated. It's actually sure. saying that if you use uh, transparency public data, so you have a... And make it a, desirable. A, absolutely. Okay. You use that index of food waste targeting industry, but by municipality, you then get a better awareness of actually, in my street, I'm wasting this much, and how much of it is going into recycling or not. That way you mm. nudge behaviour in a certain way. I think just fining people more will have the negative consequences of hitting the okay. poor, uh, and I think it will just be a re will take much longer to get to the point we need to. But be. it's also okay. good. It's also Last just good point, for, for for companies actually to recycle that food to pass it on to food banks mm. or indeed right. charities it, yeah. that it might be happening. I think we're all agree though the worst thing you could do to try and stop food waste is to eat more. <laughs> that is not what we're recommending. No, not at all. Not <laughs> at all. Just offload it onto obesity. <laughs> all right. And, well, it is <laughs> moving on because it's not just Germany, in fact, who's having a cleanup. A small group of islands, we're talking about something else here, nestled between Iceland and Norway. They've become so popular in recent years that they're having to close for maintenance. The good news is that if you can help, you can stay there for free. Let's take a look. Welcome to the Faroe Islands. Tucked away in the North Atlantic, the 18-island archipelago was, for a long time, off the tourist radar. But after years of robust campaigning, including tying cameras to these guys, the eyes of the world were open to its breathtaking beauty. And now the tourists won't stop coming. So much so, in fact, that the islands are having to temporarily close for a cleanup. But it's only a weekend, and you can help. The Faroese are appealing for volunteers offering food and a warm bed in exchange for an extra 100 pairs of hands to keep their green islands unspoiled. Well, the only bad news is that with 300 days of rain a year, the weekend will probably be a wet one. What, what?
what well, we know states, someone what eager volunteer here. What, here, what here, are those here. states again? I really want to go. I honestly, I'm so keen to. Go I to think the we should Island. take a leaf out of their book. Actually, if Close you think Brussels. about, you no, know, no, actually the tunnels. What can you do? Because people have complained. Commuters complain about the tunnels constantly. You know, the the the, the, you know, the, uh, the ceiling falling down or brickwork happening for the past 25 years. Imagine if they just did that for a week and said, actually, we're going to get You're about everyone in Brussels. Involved, right. yeah. In Brussels. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the impact that would might have. And you have a lot of happy consumers uh, up and down the oh country. Oh, my God, yeah. Well, you know you know it, it rains 300 that. days of the year in the Faroe Islands. That is still substantially less than it rains here in Brussels. It's so it. I'm booking this trip. Yeah, but Darren's asking to get End sent there. He is, he is. All right. Coming up on Raw Politics, just when you thought relations between the EU and the US couldn't get any more strained, Austria's Sebastian Kurtz sat down with Donald Trump. The latest in a string of transatlantic differences this week. Well, that's coming up next. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, EU-US relations are becoming more and more strained by the day. That much, that much was clear during the Austrian Chancellor's visit to the White House. Sebastian Kurz was hoping to ease trade tensions during a meeting with US President Donald Trump. But the two leaders did not appear to see eye to eye. Following the talks, Kurz told Austrian public broadcaster ORF that their relationship, quote, has seen better times in terms of trade and energy policy. Now, this comes after a series of disagreements between the United States and Europe. This week, Trump has demanded that the EU must take back 800 ISIS fighters captured in Syria, a call that was met with mixed response from EU nations. On the other hand, the EU is not happy about the prospect of new tariffs on European cars or Mr. Trump's decision to abandon the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. All right, joining me now in the studio, we have Lucas Mandel. He is an Austrian MEP from the same party as Chancellor Kurtz. And he's sitting also with the EPP group. And back with us is Jacek Selimovic, a Swedish MEP with the ALDE group. And of course, our political editor is still with us, Darren McCaffrey. All right, of course, I'll start with you. I mean, when, when Sebastian Kurtz went to the U.S., was there that same expectation from your party, from, your, the, from the Austrian government, that this would be a meeting of kindred spirits, so to speak? Well, actually, it was uh, the expectation of Austria, of uh, our country, of this uh, member state of EU, that the outcome of the talks it would be a positive one, and it is actually a positive one, because it's at least a step forward in not only Austria-US relations, but Europe-US relations. And as you have already mentioned, we have so many topics uh, on the table that it's important to keep up the word contentious. He used Politicians the word contentious. can put a good spin on things, yeah. can't they? Yeah, but, really? But, was the, that but the, adjective, the adjective used by Kurt is of contentious. Course. So why, why would he say that if it was a great meeting? See what I mean? Well, at least that the meeting happened is for a chancellor of a small country like our one, <coughs> something very special and a very positive moment in time. And of course, uh, Sebastian Kurz on behalf of Austria, but also as a prime minister of Europe, raised the important questions. For example, uh, the tariff questions you've already mentioned, yeah. the question about our cars, our automotive sector, which is so, known all over the world as very quality oriented. And of course, right. also security questions. So we had the opportunity uh, as Austrians and uh, I guess also as Europe to raise the important questions in a personal oh, talk. Is, okay, I will ask Jacek this because if someone like Sebastian Kurz with, let's say, a like-minded politician like, uh, like Donald Trump, I would say, if he can't get Donald Trump on the same page, and what does that, where does that leave the EU and the US in terms of finding common ground? Well, I don't think I, I that think you can was, tell okay, Sebastian sure. Kurz a uh, like-minded sure, politician. I mean, yes, 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 I don't want to interrupt, but it's important to, nationalist, yeah. no, to be clear on that. Okay, fair okay, enough. But there, fair there are certain similarities, not that the others, of course. Okay. Uh, it was a nice try. It was, a, it was needed. Mm. We have a very tense relation with the US administration. We have an urgent need to improve it. Mr. Kurtz tried to do it, mm. but I think it, is, it was actually impossible. You cannot right. have the good relation with somebody who doesn't want to have that good relation. And Mr. Trump obviously doesn't want to have it. Mm. So it's, it's difficult to kind of, you can, you can try, try, but you will not succeed. I think I was reading analysis saying that actually Mr. Kurtz is very much European, uh, you know, rather than taking America's side. And Darren, would um, I think, you know, this is clearly US-European relations are not at a good ebb at no. the moment. That is uh, clear and, and that can't be denied. Um, and we have got used to a world in which 
which kind of the European US Middle East access kind of which is enveloped world affairs has been pretty stable for the last 50 years or so but that's not changing and actually it's changing because of a policy not initiated by Donald Trump certainly initiated or talked about by Barack Obama um, if not his predecessor George W. Bush and that is that the United States is increasingly pivoting towards Asia. Uh, now, this is understandable for lots and lots of reasons, but, you know, you look at where Donald Trump is today. He's involved in so-called peace negotiations with Kim Jong-un in North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, he is trying to take on China as a genuine global competitor. Um, and, uh, you know, we're seeing increased uh, U.S. military activity in the t South China Sea. So Ch Europe is less important. So, yes, so relations are at a low ebb, but ultimately the United States is actually shifting its attention much more to Asia. So knowing that. Which, which it has done in the past. Sure. It has done in the past, and I think this is a very natural course. And, and Europe, in a sense, in this, in this era now, has to find its own feet. Yeah, should Europe yeah, be doing the same that thing? But, yes, exactly. it's relied on in the past. But the point is, you, you have a point there, because there was some kind of reprioritization of the relation bef before the Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah that was, that, that's true. But the Donald Trump idea of the European Union is not a good one. He doesn't like us. He doesn't want this union to succeed. So he's actually working on worsening the relations. And the problem is we need them. We need America. Is that why? Why wouldn't he? Okay. Well, but well, both we of it is in true. I, I totally agree with uh, the idea that Europe has to stand on its own feet even more than in the past. And mm. uh, reaching out and uh, paying a visit to the White House uh, by a European prime minister, if it's possible, is a part of standing on our own feet as long as we raise the questions which are so, important for Europe. And Sebastian Kurz raised these questions there. So how, yeah, how, does, how does Europe stand on its own feet, though? Should Europe be equally as aggressive towards America as Donald Trump is being? Uh, my my view is that we need a cooperation approach in a globalized economy and not this competitive approach with trade war ideas and things like that, as Donald Trump does. But at least we have to stay on our own feet. But he doesn't want and, to be cooperative. And, and stand then on our, stand so our ground. Question. Yeah, how do you do that when, when your partner doesn't want to be cooperative? <laughs> of course, we have, we have to convince the Americans about not only same values. I don't uh, I mean, know if anybody happy. wants to listen uh, regarding yeah, They're not even happy that Austria, they say, values. he said, is dependent on Russian gas. You know what he was saying. Well, yeah, and th that's a field where we stand our ground. Russian gas is cheaper. Uh, we have a long-term relationship with mm. them. And uh, when anybody understands what, what market and prices is about, it should mm. be the president of the United States. So that's a, uh, an example for standing on our own ground and not being dependent on anybody, but, but keeping up okay. with good relations. Last word, well, yes, talking yes, about dependence, you know, I think on that point, on energy point, Donald Trump has a point because we are too much dependable on Russia. So I think there is a point of getting rid of that dependence and trying to diversify the sources for the energy in Europe. Okay. All I would end on this is Donald Trump is in entirely inconsistent <laughs> and he's open. I mean, okay. someone I think sums it up that yeah. Donald Trump's yeah. policy on anything is what someone last told him in his mm. ear. Mm. Uh, you remember his <laughs> loving with Emmanuel Macron yeah. that lasted? If these things will right. ebb and flow, my words, uh, God it knows will. where we'll be it in a month or six months. It time. absolutely will. And again, well... On, on that note, we'd actually want to ask you, what did Europe do? Should the EU turn its back on the United States? We want to hear what you think. So do stick around in the next hour for your chance to call in and tell us what you think. Do you agree with them? Well, the contact information is on your screen. So the phone number is 0800-3333-7002 or email us at rawpoll at euronews.com. And do join the debate on Twitter and Facebook using the hashtag rawpolitics. We are all watching that. And our lines are open after the break. Welcome back to our politics. Now, we've heard from the politicians, and now we want to hear from you. Here is Darren with the Hot Topics on Your Call, our call-in show tonight. Catholic leaders from around the world have convened at the Vatican to come up with concrete ways to stop sex abuse. The Santo Popolo di Dio ci guarda e attende da noi non semplici e scontate condanne, ma misure concrete. But after decades of wrongdoing and cover-ups, including accusations against Pope Francis himself and bitter infighting on how to deal with it, has the Catholic Church lost its right to police itself? It was supposed to be an attempt to de-escalate EU-US trade relations, but a meeting between Donald Trump and Austria's Sebastian Kurz ended in yet more disagreements with threats from Washington on tariffs on European cars, 
after releasing captured IS fighters, time after time, Trump threatened Europe. So should the EU turn its back on the US? 11 million tons. That's how much food Germans throw away each year. Wenn das Produkt noch gut aussieht. Now the government is trying to cut that in half. In France, it's already illegal for restaurants to toss away unsold food. But what if it was extended to each of us? Should people be fined for throwing out foods? Have your say on our topics. Has the Catholic Church lost its right to police itself? Should the EU turn its back on the US? And should people be fined for throwing out foods? And this is how you can get in touch. There are several ways of getting in touch with us tonight. And that information you will find shortly on your screen. You can call us in at 00800-3333-7002 or send an email to rawpol at euronews.com. And on social media, use the hashtag rawpolitics. And you can also search for us on Skype. We'd like to see you. All right. Uh, now I'm joined by a correspondent, Shona Murray. And back with us, Darmendra and Darren. I'll start with you, Darren. Which of these are yeah, you really excited? People, it's a free number. Because yeah, I look at that number, line. I think, God, everyone must think that's a premium rate telephone number. It's free. It's free. It's, um, it's what, so I'm actually excited about food waste. Mm. I'm, right. I get quite passionate about it because... Mm. Um, you know, I live on my own and actually I'm not here all the time. And so you need to buy food. You go to the supermarket mm. and invariably I do end up throwing stuff away because I'm just not there all of the exactly. time. And actually, you know, there are one of the things we didn't touch on earlier on mm. is that there are far fewer families than there were. There are far more people living right. on, their own, on their own. And actually yeah. supermarkets true, yeah. and companies have not reacted. No. Yeah. To send, they sell yeah. stuff Maybe. to you as if you were a family of six. And you have to buy more mm. rather than buy cheaper. And that's the problem. Yeah. You end up buying, you know, two dozen something and you're never going to use them. So, but if you were going to be fined for that, would that make you think again before you make your purchases? Well, I, it, it, it would. I, I genuinely think it would. But in my response to that is it's, it is up to it's up to companies to react mm. to that because mm. you know you can buy a loaf of bread. I'm not going to eat a whole loaf of bread in mm. three or four days. I think or that's a week. what they did you, in, you, in like Denmark. Smaller, smaller. Yeah. actual food portions would be My most welcome. Obesity as well. I, I was just reading that in Denmark, instead of selling bananas when, when they're about to go off, they sell them in single packs and the food waste went down by 90%. So that's a, yeah. an example of what or you're stop, Or stop selling these buy one, get one exactly. free. Exactly. All right. like, so, what, what are the topics to you? Catholic Church. Right. Yeah, oh, well, right well, there to, you go. To, to <laughs> to I think no institution uh, that is as pious as the Catholic Church and as globally reaching has failed as bad as the Catholic Church in terms of Can dealing with... Can they actually with, sort, sort themselves out? I don't know. I think it's uh, I think it's too too deep, too wide. The hurt is too strong, and mm. the opportunities given to the Catholic Church have been wasted away. Yeah. And of course, we know there has been prosecutions, yeah. Uh, yeah. obviously, yeah. but very few in comparison to the level of abuse. I mean, I, and, I come from well, Ireland, the epicenter yeah. of the. Well, there you go. What do you think? So don't forget abuses. to join in the conversation, which you will have with our, our host tonight and our guest, our mentor. What about you? What's which? Uh... I, obviously, all of those topics, because sure. uh, yeah. I think it would be really interesting to hear from people on the ground because they always have created solution to some of these problems. True. There's, a true. there's a kind of classic issue here about regulation versus nudge, or how do you, how do you change behaviour versus regulation on, on all of mm. this? So I think that's a really important topic, mm. and I'd be really keen to hear from people what they think about that. But also I think the US-EU relations issue is not going to go away, and in sure. the context of the forthcoming elections, it'd be really interesting to hear from citizens and people on the ground what they think about it at this stage. Yeah, it's kind of like, so do, do Europeans want to stick up yeah. their it's finger at the United States? Blip, well, there you <laughs> go. That's another way fingers. of asking that. Yeah. All right, so we want to hear from you. And again, there are many ways of getting in touch. So do look at your screen. So that's the phone number, the free phone number, 0800-3333-7002. Email at rawpaul at euronews.com. We're on Twitter, Facebook, all of us are on social media. Use the hashtag rawpolitics and search for us on Skype and join everybody here on the show. Well, not except for me. All right. Tonight, <laughs> uh, we have time for Raw Moment with the Brexit talks really going down the wire. Many here in Brussels, they actually think avoiding a no deal may well be a close shave. Take a look. Je porte le résultat d'un geste euh, non intentionné que j'ai commis ce matin. Je me suis rasé pour la première fois de ma vie à l'âge de 15 ans. Très puberté, j'ai saigné. Je me suis dit ce matin, je vais réessayer. Vous verrez le résultat dans la période post-pubertaire de ma, de ma vie. Je vous le dis pour que ne pensiez pas que, que ce sera mal d'un pays. 
m'aurait infligé sa euh, blessure. We're Aren't we going to miss? I was just going to say we're going to miss Jean-Claude Juncker. He is. He's very entertaining. He's he is. Very he's, we won't. We, we won't have those videos at all. Well, we, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know who's going to give us that. All right. Thank you for joining us tonight. Don't forget to call in for your call next after the show. Have a good evening.